In the Shadow of Another World by Thomas Ligotti Many times in my life, and in many different places, I have found myself walking at twilight down streets lined with gently stirring trees and old silent houses. On such lulling occasions, things seem firmly anchored, quietly settled, and exceedingly present to the natural eye. Over distant rooftops, the sun abandons the scene and casts its last light upon windows, watered lawns, the edges of leaves. In this drowsy setting, both great things and small achieve an intricate union, apparently leaving not the least space for anything else to intrude upon their visible domain. But other realms are always capable of making their presence felt, hovering unseen like strange cities disguised as clouds, or hidden like a world of pale specters within a fog. One is besieged by orders of entity that refuse to articulate their exact nature or proper milieu, and soon those well-aligned streets reveal that they are, in fact, situated among bizarre landscapes, where simple trees and houses are marvelously obscured, where everything is settled within the depths of a vast, echoing abyss. Even the infinite sky itself, across which the sun spreads its expansive light, is merely a blurry little window with a crack in it, a jagged fracture beyond which one may see, at twilight, what pervades a vacant street lined with gently stirring trees and old silent houses. On one particular occasion, I followed a tree-lined street past all the houses and continued until it brought me to a single house a short distance from town. As the road before me narrowed into a bristling path, and the path ascended in a swerving course up the side of a hump in the otherwise even landscape, I stood before my day's destination. Like other houses of its kind, I have seen so many of them outlined against a pale sky at dusk. This one possessed the aspect of a mirage, a chimerical quality that led one to doubt its existence. Despite its dark and angular mass, its peaks and porches and worn wooden steps, there was something improperly tenuous about its substance, as if it had been constructed of illicit materials, dreams and vapor posing as solid matter. And this was not the full extent of its resemblance to a true chimera, for somehow the house projected itself as having acquired its present form through a fabulous overlap of properties. There seemed to be the appearance of petrified flesh in its rough outer surfaces, and it was very simple to imagine an inner framework, not of beams and boards, but rather of gigantic bones from great beasts of old. The chimneys and shingles, windows and doorways, were thus the embellishments of a later age, which had misunderstood the real essence of this ancient monstrosity, transforming it into a motley and ludicrous thing. Little wonder, then, that in shame it would attempt to reject its reality, and pass itself off as only a shadow on the horizon, a thing of nightmarish beauty that aroused impossible hopes. As in the past, I looked to the unseen interior of such a house to be the focus of unknown celebrations. It was my conviction that the inner world of these dwellings participated, after their own style, in a kind of ceremonious desolation, that translucent festivals might be glimpsed in the corners of certain rooms and that the faraway sounds of mad carnivals filled certain hallways at all hours of the day and night. I am afraid, however, that a peculiar feature of the house in question prevented full indulgence in my usual anticipations. My reference here is to a turret built into one side of the house, and rising to an unusual height beyond its roof, so that it looked out upon the world as a lighthouse, diminishing the aspect of introspection that is vital to such structures. And near the cone-roofed peak of this turret, a row of large windows appeared to have been placed, as a quite recent modification, around its entire circumference. But if the house was truly employing its windows to gaze outward more than within, what it saw was nothing. For all the windows of the three ample stories of the house, as well as those of the turret and that small octagonal aperture in the attic, were shuttered closed. This was, in fact, the state in which I anticipated finding the house, since I had already exchanged numerous letters with Raymond Spare, the present owner. 
I thought you would arrive much sooner, Spare said on opening the door. It's almost nightfall, and I was sure you understood that only at certain times. My apologies, but I'm here now. Shall I come in? Spare stepped aside and gestured theatrically toward the interior of the house, as if he were presenting one of those dubious spectacles that had earned him a substantial livelihood. It was out of an instinct for mystification that he had adopted the surname of the famed visionary and artist, even claiming some blood or spiritual kinship with this great eccentric. But tonight I was playing the skeptic, as I had my correspondence with Spare, so that I might force him to earn my credence. There would have been no other way to gain his invitation to witness the phenomena that, as I understood from sources other than the illusionistic Spare, were well worth my attention. Unexpectedly, my host was mundane in appearance, which made it difficult to keep in mind his reputation for showmanship, his gift for trumped-up histrionics. "'You have left everything as he had it before you?' I asked, referring to the deceased former owner whose name Spare never disclosed to me, though I knew it all the same. But that was of no importance. "'Yes, very much as it was. Excellent housekeeper, all things considered.' Spare's observation was regrettably true. The interior of the house was immaculate to the point of being suspect. The great parlor in which we now sat, as well as those other rooms and hallways that receded into the house, exuded the atmosphere of a plush and well-tended mausoleum, where the dead are truly at rest. The furnishings were dense and archaic, yet they betrayed no oppressive awareness of other times no secret conspiracies with departed spirits, regardless of the unnatural mood of twilight created by fastidiously clamped shutters which admitted none of nature's true twilight from the outside world. The clock that I heard resonantly ticking in a nearby room caused no sinister echoes to sound between dark polished floors and lofty uncobwebbed ceilings. Absent was all fear or hope of encountering a malign presence in the cellar, or an insane shadow in the attic. Despite a certain odd effect created by thaumaturgic curios appearing on a shelf, as well as a hermetic chart of the heavens nicely framed and hanging upon a wall, no hint of hauntedness was evoked by either the surfaces or obscurities of this house. Quite an innocent ambiance, said Spare, who displayed no special prowess in voicing this thought of mine. Astonishingly so. Was that part of his intention? Spare laughed. The truth is, is that this was his original intention, the genesis of what later occupied his genius. In the beginning, a spiritual wasteland? Exactly, Spare confirmed. Sterile, but safe. You understand, then. His reputation was for risk, not retreat. But the notebooks are very clear on the suffering caused by his fantastic gifts, his incredible sensitivity, he required spiritually antiseptic surroundings, yet was hopelessly tempted by the visionary. Again and again in his notebooks he describes himself as overwhelmed to the point of madness. You can appreciate the irony. I can certainly appreciate the horror, I replied. Of course. Well, tonight we will have the advantage of his unfortunate experience. Before the evening advances much further, I want to show you where he worked. And the shuttered windows? I asked. They are very much to the point, he answered. The workshop of which Spare had spoken was located, as one might have surmised, in the uppermost story of the turret in the westernmost part of the house. This circular room could only be reached by climbing a twisting and tenuous stairway into the attic, where a second set of stairs led up into the turret. Spare fumbled with the key to the low wooden door, and soon we had gained entrance. The room was definitely what Spare had implied, a workshop, or at least the remains of one. It seems that toward the end he had begun to destroy his apparatus, as well as some of his work, Spare explained, as I stepped into the room and saw the debris everywhere. Much of the mess consisted of shattered panes of glass that had been colored and distorted in strange ways. A number of them still existed intact, leaning against the curving wall or lying upon a long work table. A few were set up on wooden easels like paintings in progress, the bizarre transformations of their surfaces left unfinished. These panes of corrupted glass had been cut into a variety of shapes, 
and each had affixed to it, upon a little card, a scribbled character resembling an oriental ideograph. Similar symbols, although much larger, had been inscribed into the wood of the shutters that covered the windows all around the room. A symbiology that I cannot pretend to understand, Spare admitted, except in its function. Here, see what happens when I remove these labels with the little figures squiggled on them. I watched as Spare went about the room, stripping the misshapen glyphs from those chromatically deformed panels of glass and it was not long before I noticed a change in the general character of the room, a shift in atmospherics as when a clear day is suddenly complicated by the shadowy nuances of clouds. Previously, the circular chamber had been bathed in a twisted kaleidoscope of colors as the simple lights around the room diffused through the strangely tinted window panes. But the effect had been purely decorative, an experience restricted to the realm of aesthetics, with no implications of the spectral. Now, however, a new element permeated the room, partially and briefly exposing qualities of quite a different order in which the visible gave way to the transcendental. What formerly had appeared as an artist's studio, however eccentric, was gradually inheriting the aura of a stained glass cathedral, albeit one that had suffered some obscure desecration. In certain places upon the floor, the ceiling, and the circular wall with the shuttered windows, I perceived through those prismatic lenses vague forms which seemed to be struggling toward visibility, freakish outlines laboring to gain full embodiment. Whether their nature was that of the dead or the demonic, or possibly some peculiar progeny generated by their union, I could not tell. But whatever class of creation they seemed to occupy at the time, they was certain that they were gaining, not only in clarity and substance, but also in size, swelling and surging and expanding their universe toward an eclipse of this world's vision. Is it possible, I said, turning to spare, that this effect of magnification is solely a property of the medium through which... But before I could complete my speculation, spare was rushing about the room, frantically replacing the symbols on each sheet of glass, dissolving the images into a quivering translucence, and then obliterating or masking them altogether. The room lapsed once again into its former state of iridescent sterility. Then Spare hastily ushered me back to the ground floor, the door to the turret room standing locked behind us. Afterward, he served as my guide through the other, less crucial rooms of the house, each of which was sealed by dark shutters, and all of which shared in the same barren atmosphere, the aftermath of a strange exorcism a purging of the grounds which left them neither hallowed nor unholy, but had simply turned them into a pristine laboratory where a fearful genius had practiced his science of nightmares. We passed several hours in the small lamplit library. The sole window of that room was curtained, and I imagined that I saw the night's darkness behind the pattern. But when I put my hand upon that symmetrical and velvety design, I felt only solidity on the other side as if I had touched a coffin beneath its pall. It was this barrier that made the world outside seem twice darkened, although I knew that when the shutters were opened, I would be faced with one of the clearest nights ever seen. For some time, Spare read to me passages from the notebooks whose cryptography he had broken. I sat and listened to a voice that was accustomed to speaking of miracles, a well-practiced tout of mystical freak shows. Yet I also detected a grave sincerity in his words, which is to say that his usual unruffled patter contained dissonant overtones of fear. We sleep, he read, among the shadows of another world. These are the unshapely substance inflicted upon us and the prime material to which we give the shapes of our understanding. And though we create what is seen, yet we are not the creators of its essence. Thus nightmares are born from the impress of ourselves on the life of things unknown. How terrible these forms of specter and demon when the eyes of the flesh cast light and mold the shadows which are forever around us. How much more terrible to witness their true forms roaming free upon the land, or in the most homely rooms of our houses, or frolicking through that luminous hell which in pursuit of psychic survival we have named the heavens. Then we truly waken from our sleep, 
but only to sleep once more and shun the nightmares which must ever return to that part of us which is hopelessly dreaming. After witnessing some of the phenomena which had inspired this hypothesis, I could not escape becoming somewhat entranced with its elegance, if not with its originality. Nightmares both within and around us had been integrated into a system that seemed to warrant admiration. However, the scheme was ultimately no more than terror recollected in tranquility, a formula reflecting little of the mazy trauma that had initiated these speculations. Should it be called revelation or delirium, when the mind interposes itself between the sensations of the soul and a monstrous mystery? Truth was not an issue in this matter, nor were the mechanics of the experiment, which, even if faulty, yielded worthy results. And in my mind it was faithfulness to the mystery and its terror that was paramount, even sacred. In this the theoretician of nightmares had failed, fallen on the lucid blade of theories that, in the end, could not save him. On the other hand, those wonderful symbols that Spare was at a loss to illuminate, those crude and cryptic designs, represented a genuine power against the mystery's madness, yet could not be explained by the most esoteric analysis. As the erstwhile owner of the house knew, we truly live in the shadow of another world, one which he designed his residence either to shut out or reveal as he chose, but which in the end overtook him before he had a chance to shutter for good those windows that disclose the deranged and terrible quiddity of existence. I have a question, I said to Spare, when he had closed the volume he held on his lap. The shutters elsewhere in the house are not painted with the signs that are on those in the turret. Can you enlighten me? Spare led me to the window and drew back the curtains. Very cautiously he pulled out one of the shutters just far enough to expose its edge, which revealed that something of a contrasting color and texture composed a layer between the two sides of the dark wood. Engraved upon a panel of glass, placed inside each shutter, he explained. And the ones in the turret? I asked. The same. Whether the extra set of symbols there are precautionary or merely redundant... His voice had faded and then stopped, though the pause did not seem to imply any thoughtfulness on Spare's part. Yes, I prompted. Precautionary or redundant? For a moment he revived. That is, whether the symbols were an added measure against... It was at this point that Spare mentally abandoned the scene following within his own mind some controversy or suspicion, a witness to a dramatic conflict being enacted upon a remote and shadowy stage. Spare, I said in a somewhat normal voice. Spare, he repeated, but in a voice that was not his own, a voice that sounded more like the echo of a voice than natural speech. And for a moment I asserted my pose of skepticism, placing none of my confidence in Spare or in the things he had thus far shown me, for I knew that he was an adept of pasteboard visions, a medium whose hauntings were of mucilage and gauze. But how much more subtle and skillful were the present effects, as though he were manipulating the very atmosphere around us, pulling the strings of light and shadow. The clearest light is now shining, he said in that hollow, tremulous voice. Now light is flowing in the glass, he spoke, placing his hand upon the shutter before him. Shadows gathering against... against... And it seemed that Spare was not so much pulling the shutter away from the window as trying to push the shutter closed while it slowly opened further and further, allowing a strange radiance to leak gradually into the house. It also appeared that he finally gave up the struggle and let another force guide his actions. Flowing together in me, he repeated, several times as he went from window to window, methodically opening the shutters like a sleepwalker performing some obscure ritual. Ransoming all judgment to fascination, I watched him pass through each room on the main floor of the house, executing his duties like an old servant. Then he ascended a long staircase, and I heard his footsteps traversing the floor above, evenly pacing from one side of the house to the other. He was now a night watchman making his rounds in accordance with a strange design. The sound of his movements grew fainter as he progressed to the next floor and continued to perform the services required of him. I listened very closely as he proceeded on his somnambulistic course into the attic. 
and when I heard the echoes of a distant door as it slammed shut, I knew he had gone into that room in the turret. Engrossed in the lesser phenomenon of Spare's suddenly altered behavior, I had momentarily overlooked the greater one of the windows. But now I could no longer ignore those phosphorescent panes which focused or reflected the incredible brilliance of the sky that night. As I followed Spare's circuit about the main floor, I saw that each room was glowing with the superlunary light that was outlined by each window frame. In the library I paused and approached one of the windows, reaching out to touch its wrinkled surface, and I felt a lively rippling in the glass, as if there actually were some force flowing within it, an uncanny sensation that my tingling fingertips will never be able to forget. But it was the scene beyond the glass that finally possessed my attention. For a few moments I looked out only upon the level landscape that surrounded the house, its open expanse lying desolate and pale beneath the resplendent heavens. Then, almost inconspicuously, different scenes or fragments of scenes began to intrude upon the outside vicinity, as if other geographies of the earth were being superimposed upon the local one, composing a patchwork of images that might seem to have been the hallucinated tableau of some cosmic tapestry. The windows, which for lack of a more accurate term I must call enchanted, had done their work. For the visions they offered were indeed those of a haunted world, a multifaceted mural portraying the marriage of insanity and metaphysics. As the images clarified, I witnessed all the intersections which commonly remain unseen to earthly sight, the conjoining of planes of entity which should exclude each other and should no more be mingled than is flesh with the inanimate objects that surround it. But this is precisely what took place in the scenes before me and it appeared that there existed no place on earth that was not the home of a spectral ontogeny. Sunlit bazaars and exotic cities, thronged with faces that were transparent masks for insectoid countenances. Moonlit streets and antique towns harbored a strange-eyed slithering within their very stones. Dim galleries of empty museums sprouted a ghostly mold that mirrored the sullen hues of old paintings. The land at the edge of oceans gave birth to a new evolution transcending biology, and remote islands offered themselves as a haven for forms having no analogy outside of dreams. Jungles teemed with beast-like shapes that moved beside the sticky luxuriance as well as through the depths of its pulpy warmth. Deserts were alive with an uncanny flux of sounds which might enter and animate the world of substance and subterranean landscapes heaved with cadaverous generations that had sunken and merged into sculptures of human coral, bodies heaped and unwhole, limbs projecting without order, eyes scattered and searching the darkness. My own eyes suddenly closed, shutting out the visions for a moment, and during that moment I once again became aware of the sterile quality of the house, of its innocent ambiance. It was then that I realized that this house was possibly the only place on Earth, perhaps in the entire universe, that had been cured of the plague of phantoms that raged everywhere. This achievement, however futile or perverse, now elicited from me tremendous admiration as a monument to terror and the stricken ingenuity it may inspire. And my admiration intensified as I pursued the way that Spare had laid out for me and ascended a black staircase to the second floor. For on this level, where room followed upon room through a maze of interconnecting doors which Spare had left open, there seemed to be an escalation in the optical power of the windows, thus heightening the threat to the house and its inhabitants. What had appeared through the windows of the floor below, as scenes in which spectral monstrosities had merely intruded upon orthodox reality, were now magnified to the point where that reality underwent a further eclipse. The other realm became dominant and pushed through the cover of masks, the concealment of stones, spread its moldy growths at will, generating apparitions of the most feverish properties and intentions, erecting formations that enshadowed all familiar order. By the time I reached the third floor, I was somewhat prepared for what I might find, granted the elevating intensity of the visions to which the windows were giving increasingly greater force and focus. 
Each window was now a framed phantasmagoria of churning and forever changing shapes and colors, fabulous depths and distances opening to the fascinated eye, grotesque transfigurations that suggested a purely supernatural order, a systemless cosmogony reeling with all the caprice of the immaterial. And as I wandered through those empty and weirdly lucent rooms at the top of house, it seemed that the house itself had been transported to another universe. I have no idea how long I had been enthralled by the chaotic fantasies imposing themselves upon the unprotected rooms of my mind. But this trance was eventually interrupted by a commotion emanating from an even higher room, the very crown of the turret, and as it were, the cranial chamber of that many-eyed beast of a house. Making my way up the narrow, spiraling stairs to the attic, I found that there too Spare had unsealed the octagonal window which now seemed the gazing eye of some god as it cast forth a pyrotechnic craze of colors and gave a frenzied life to shadows. Through this maze of illusions I followed the voice, which was merely a vibrating echo of vocal utterance, the counterpart in sound to the swirling sights around me. I climbed the very last stairway to the door, leading into the turret, listening to the reverberant words that sounded from the other side. Now the shadows are moving in the stars, as they are moving within me, within all things. And their brilliance must reach throughout all things, all the places which are created according to the essence of these shadows and of ourselves. This house is an abomination, a vacuum, and a void. Nothing must stand against, against. And with each repetition of this last word, it seemed that a struggle was taking place, and that the echoing alien voice was fading as the tone of Spare's natural voice was gaining dominance. Finally, Spare appeared to have resumed full possession of himself. Then there was a pause, a brief interim during which I considered a number of doubtful strategies, anxious not to misuse this moment of unknown and extravagant possibilities. Was it merely the end of life that faced one who remained in that room? Could the experience that had preceded the disappearance of that other visionary, under identical circumstances, perhaps be worth the strange price one would be asked to pay? No occult theories, no arcane analyses, could be of any use in making my decision, nor justly serve the sensations of those few seconds when I stood gripping the handle of that door, waiting for the impulse or accident that would decide everything. All that existed for the moment was the irreducible certainty of nightmare. From the other side of the door there now came a low, echoing laughter, a sound which became louder as the laughing one approached. But I was not moved by this sound, and did nothing except grip the door handle more tightly, dreaming of the great shadows and the stars, of the strange visions beyond the windows, and of an infinite catastrophe. Then I heard a soft, scraping noise at my feet. Looking down, I saw several small rectangles projecting from under the door, fanned out like a hand of cards. My only action was to stoop and retrieve one of them, to stare in mindless wonderment at the mysterious symbol which decorated its face. I counted the others, realizing that none had been left attached to the windows within the room and the turret. It was the thought of what effect these windows might have, now that they had been stripped of their protective signs and stood in the full glare of starlight, that made me call out to spare, even though I could not be sure that he still existed as his former self. But by then the hollow laughter had stopped, and I am sure that the last voice I heard was that of Raymond Spare. And when the voice began screaming, the windows, it said, pulling me into the stars and shadows, I could not help trying to enter the room. But now that the impetus for this action had arrived, it proved to be useless for both Spare and myself, for the door was securely locked, and Spare's voice was fading into nothingness. I can only imagine what those last few moments were like, among all the windows of that turret room, and among orders of existence beyond all definition. That night, it was to spare alone that such secrets were confided. He was the one to whom it fell, by some disaster or design, to be among the elect. Such privileged arcana, on this occasion at least, were not to be mine. Nevertheless, it seemed at the time that some fragment of this experience might be salvaged, 
and to do this, I believed, was a simple matter of abandoning the house. My intuition was correct, for as soon as I had gone out into the night and turned back to face the house, I could see that its rooms were no longer empty, no longer the pristine apartments I had lamented earlier that evening. As I had thought, these windows were for looking in as well as out, and from where I stood, the sights were now all inside the house, which had become an edifice possessed by the festivities of another world. I remained there until morning, when a cold sunlight settled the motley phantasms of the night before. Years later, I had the opportunity to revisit the house. In conformity with my intuition, I found the place bare and abandoned. Every one of its window frames was empty, and there was not a sign of glass anywhere. In the nearby town, I discovered that the house had also acquired a bad reputation. For years, no one had gone near it. Wisely avoiding the enchantments of hell, the citizens of the town had kept to their own little streets of gently stirring trees and old silent houses. And what more can they do in the way of caution? How can they know what it is their houses are truly nestled among? They cannot see, nor even wish to see, that world of shadows with which they consort every moment of their brief and innocent lives. But often, perhaps during the visionary time of twilight, I am sure they have sensed it.